Chapter 3 Present I'm almost positive that the elevator is shrinking. Nothing dramatic, really. But I estimate that every minute we spend in here, the car gets a couple of millimeters smaller. I've tucked myself into a corner, arms around my legs and forehead on my knees. Last I glanced up, Eric was in the opposite corner, looking fairly relaxed. My long legs stretched out in front of him, sequoia white biceps crossed on his chest, and, of course, the walls are looming over me, pushing us closer and closer together. I shiver and curse power outages. The walls, Eric, myself. Are you cold? He asks. I lift my head, I'm wearing my usual work outfit of chinos and a nice blues, solid, neutral colors, professional enough to be taken seriously, modest enough to convince the dudes I meet through work that my presence at any given meeting is to assess the efficacy of the biofiltration system design and not to provide them with something cute to look at. Being a woman in engineering can be tons and tons of fun. Eric though, Eric looks a bit different. He's wearing jeans and a dark soft sweater that stretches around his chest. And it seems unusual. Given that in the past, I've only ever seen him in a suit. Then again, I've only ever seen Eric twice before, technically on the same day. That is, if one doesn't count the times in the past month that I glimpsed him around the building and promptly turned away to change direction, which I very much don't. Still, I cannot help but wonder if the reason he looks uncharacteristically informal is that earlier today he was working on site, supervising, consulting, maybe he was called in to give recommendations on the Milton project and yeah, not going there. I straighten and square my shoulders, my resentment for Eric Nowak the feeling I've been crawling in my pocket like a little mouse for the past three weeks, the one I've been feeding Bill and Scraps, stirs awake. And honestly, it feels nice, familiar. It reminds me that Eric doesn't really care whether I'm cold. I bet he has ulterior motives for asking. Maybe he wants to sell my organs, or he's planning on establishing a pea corner on my rooting corpse. I'm fine, I say. You sure? I can give you my sweater. I briefly picture him taking it off and handing it to me. I've seen him do it before in flesh and blood, which means that I wouldn't even need to get creative. I remember well the way he grabbed the collar and pulled it off over his head, his muscles flexing and contracting, the sudden expanse of pale flesh. He'd hold the shirt out to me, and it'd still be warm, maybe even smell like his skin or like his sheets. Whoa, 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 what was that? I've been in this elevator for approximately 9 minutes and my brain is already developing Swiss cheesy style holes. Holding on strong, Sadie Grantham. Congrats on your emotional fortitude. Way to be horny for a truly horrible person. No need, I say, shaking my head a little too eagerly. Are you sure we should just wait? I ask. Just do nothing and wait? He nods calmly, clearly broadcasting that it's not hard for him to be a good sport about this situation. 
that the idea of being stuck with me doesn't bother him one bit and that, unlike someone of us, he's not tempted to bury his face in his hands and cry. Show off. What if we scream? I ask. Scream? Yes. What if we scream? This is a giant building. Someone is bound to hear us, right? At 11 on a Friday night? His reply is much kinder than my idiotic question deserves. While the elevator is stuck between floors? This elevator? I look away because he's right, frustratingly right. This cursed elevator we're on is in the deepest part of the building. Next to a hallway no one would walk by at night. A true tragedy, overshadowed only by the fact that it also has the narrowest car I've ever seen. Guests and clients rarely use it, which is why it has the advantage of being quicker and the disadvantage of being small. As in middle school, I knew it was tiny, but there's nothing like realizing that this might be the place where I died to register how tiny. If I stretch my arms, I'll bump into Eric. If I stretch my legs, I'll bump into Eric. If I thrash around on the floor like I so desperately want to, I'll also bump into Eric. What a quandary. Are you okay? He asks softly. His eyes look soft too. A ball of something I cannot quite define nuts into my chest. Yeah, here. He rummages in his bag for a moment, then holds something out to me. Have some water. I don't know why I accepted his 2019 NYC Amateur Soccer League water bottle. I don't know why my fingers brush against his for the briefest of moments. And I don't know why, as I drink small sips, he starts me with something that resembles concern. He's not really concerned, because Eric Nowak is just not that kind of guy. The kind of guy he actually is? A backstabber? A liar? A sentient human McMansion who values only his own professional success? and FC Copenhagen supporter, which, it pleases me to say, is a mediocre soccer team at best. Yes, I said what I said. Better? I told you, I'm fine. I'm totally great. You look pale. His head tilts, as if to observe me better. Are you claustrophobic? No, I don't think so. Am I though? It would explain a lot. The walls closing in, this greasy, barfy feeling in my stomach, the way I'd love to claw at this place because it's so small and Eric takes up so much room inside my head and I can smell his soap and I just want to forget everything about him and maybe I thought I had but now he's here and it's all coming back and I Sadie Eric is looking at me like he knows exactly what kind of spiral is currently unfolding in my brain take a deep breath I know I am taking deep breaths that's it or maybe I wasn't, because now, with some air in my lungs, my brain is getting a tad quieter. Is it your first time? I blink at him, breathing. He smiles faintly, like he doesn't mind that we're going to die in here. Being stuck in an elevator. Oh yes, I think about it for a moment. Wait. Is it not yours? 
third, third? He nods. Are you cursed or something? I see your superstitions are going strong, he says, clearly teasing. And the idea that he thinks he knows me, the fact that after everything that happened, he'd feel allowed to joke with me. I stiffen. And judging by his sp and judging by his sp and judging by his expression, Eric notices. Sadie, I'm fine, I interrupt him. I promise. But could we please just be quiet for a little bit? I hate how weak my voice sounds. I set down the water bottle and hide my face back in my knees. I listen to his sharp exhale, to the tense, uncomfortable silence that falls between us, and try not to think about the last time I was with him, when I never wanted to stop talking, not even for a second. Chapter 4 Three Weeks Ago I have my pitch meeting in one hour, a little mountain of gigabytes of files to review, and I'm pretty sure that my interns are currently 18 floors above, trying to decide whether I abandoned them to join a cult or have been abducted by an urban Sasquatch. But I cannot help staring at corporate Thor's mouth as he tells me matter of factly. Money laundering front. No way. He shrugs. We are sitting right next to each other on a bench in a pocket park that, as it turns out, is just behind my building. The sun is shining, the birds are chirping. I have spotted at least three butterflies, and yet I remain vaguely intimidated by his size and his cheekbones. It's the only possible explanation, I bite my lip, trying to think it through. Couldn't Faye just be, you know, a really bad baker? She certainly is. Her coffee is also questionable. It is very reminiscent of brake fluid, I concede. I always thought of plasma coolant. Point is, She was here 10 years ago, when I started working in that building, and she'll be here long after you and I are gone. Despite that, he points at the croissant, I'm still clutching. Honestly, I should just bite the bullet and choke it down. My hand sweat is not going to make it any tastier. There is no valid entrepreneurial reason for her to still be in business. I nod thoughtfully. He might have a point. Aside from money laundering operations and ties to organized crime? Precisely. Okay, his grammar might be perfect, but I'm starting to pick up a vague forging accent. I want to ask a million and ten questions about it. I wish in direct competition with my desire to not come across as a weirdo. A lofty goal, as I am. In fact, a weirdo. I see your theory, but hear me out. I blow my bangs out of my eyes. Eric's expression doesn't move a nanometer, but I know he's listening. There is something about him, like his attention is something physically tangible, like he's good at seeing and hearing and knowing. So, remember how I talked about my mm, problem? The magical thinking one? Where you believe that your professional success relates to the items you ate for breakfast? I cannot believe I admitted to it. God, he already knows I'm a weirdo. Though, to his credit, He seems to be taking it in stride. Okay, listen. I know it sounds like I'm foolishly clutching the atavistic remnants of ancient times. Sounds? His eyebrow lifts. I might be flushing. 
I like to think of it as more of a way to bind myself and celebrate the traditions of my previous successes, you know? and less as establishing an empirical causal connection between the color of my underwear and future events. I see. The corner of his mouth twitches upward, just barely, though still not a smile. Maybe he's not capable, maybe he has a debilitating medical condition. Smilopathy. Now with its very own ICD-10 code. So, what's the lucky color? What? Of underwear. Oh, um, lavender. He seems briefly stumped. Purple? Kind of, yeah. I forgot that most men can't name more than five colors. A little lighter between purple and pink pastel like he nods slowly like he's trying to picture it cute he says and his tone is as simple and straightforward as it's been in the last few minutes there is absolutely no creepy lasciviousness as thought he's complimenting a flower or a puppy my heart skips a bit nonetheless would he? If he saw me wearing my... Would he still think that? Oh my god. What is wrong with me? This poor man just gave me his croissant. Anyway, I hasten to add. Maybe there are a lot of people buying good luck croissants. Because I'm not alone in my magical thinking. Nice way to put it, by the way. For example, my friend Hannah works at NASA and she says that the engineers there have had whole complex routines involving planters, peanuts and mission launches for the past like 50 years. And I'm an engineer, basically. I'm professional required to... You're an engineer? His eyes widen in surprise. My heart sinks with disappointment. Oh God. He's one of those. I can't believe he's one of those. I scold and stand from the bench, looking down at him with a frown. FYI, in the US, 15% of the engineering workforce is made up of women, so there is no need to be so shocked that I'm not. My frown deepens. You sure look like I'm an engineer myself. And it seemed like a coincidence of sorts. His mouth twitches again. I thought your magical thinking might be tickled. Oh, my cheeks burn. Oh, wow. Am I the asshole Reddit? Why? You kind of are, Sadie. Sorry. I didn't mean to imply. Where did you study? He asks, unruffled, pulling at my wrist till I sit again. I end up a little closer to him than I was before, but it's fine, it's okay. Siri, how many times can I utterly humiliate myself in the span of 30 minutes? Infinite, you say? Thank you, that's what I figured. Um, Coltec. I finished my PhD last year, you? NYU, got my masters 10, 11 years ago. We stare at each other, me calculating his age, him? I don't know, maybe he's calculating too. He must be 6 or 7 years older than me, not that it's in any way relevant, we're just chatting. We're going our separate ways in 12 seconds. Where do you work? He asks. Green frame, you? Pro BLD. I scrunch my nose, instantly recognizing the name. From both the plaques in the lobby of my office building and the New York engineer 
grapevine, there are lots of firms in this area, and he works at my least favorite. The big jellyfish that keeps expanding by eating the smaller jellyfish. Not that they are terrible, they're fine, but they're old school and don't focus on sustainability nearly as much as we do. But they do have a solid rep, and some of our potential clients even choose them over us because of that, which bleh. Did you just make a repulsed face when I mentioned my company? No, no, I mean, yeah, a little, but I didn't mean it in any offensive way. They just don't seem to adopt a whole systems approach to problem solving when dealing with environmental challenges. His eyes shine. Is he teasing me? Does corporate thought this? I mean, I am now over 20 minutes late for work. Realistically, I'll probably be fired and end up begging you guys for a job. He nods, lips pressed together. God, I have an in with the partners. Is that so? I'm sure they'd love to have you on board, to develop a whole systems approach to problem solving when dealing with environmental challenges. I stick out my... I stick out my thong, which he ignores. What name should I give when I recommend you? Oh, Sadie Grantham. I hold out my non croissant hand. He looks at it for a long moment, and I am suddenly, inexplicably, tsunamingly afraid. Oh my god, what if he won't take it? Yeah, Sadie? A wise, mean, pragmatic voice whispers in my ear. What if a stranger won't take your hand? How will you deal with the 0.0, .0 impact it'll have on your life? But the voice is moot, because he does take it, and my heart gallops at how nice his skin feels, solid and a little rough. His hands swallows my fingers, warming my flesh and the cheap cute rings I put on this morning. Nice to meet you, Dr. Grantham. My breath hitches, my heart melts. I've had my PhD for less than a year, so I still relish being called doctor, especially because no one ever does. Eric Nowak. Well, no one ever does expect for Eric Nowak. Can I ask you something kind of inappropriate? He shakes his head. Slowly, gravely, unfortunately, I am not wearing purple underwear. I love. No. It's... When you write your last name, are there cool fancy letters in it? I blurred the question out and instantly regret it. I'm not even sure what I'm asking. I'll just roll with it, I guess. It has an N and a W. Are they considered fancy? Not really. Pretty boring. Sure. He nods. What about the K? It's my favorite letter. Er, yeah, that's fancy too. Still boring. But surely not the A? Uh, well, I guess the A is... His mouth is twitching again. He's teasing me. Again. I hate him. Damn you. I say with that hit. He's almost smiling. Not umla, no dia diacritics, no molar, or chiaresco, or adult's gold. Though I did go to school with them, I not, vaguely disappointed, till he asks, disappointed? And then I can't help hiding behind my croissant and laughing. When I'm done, he's definitely smiling, and he says, you should really eat that or you'll lose your client and NASA's next rocket will explode. Right, yes, 
I tear a piece away, hold it out to him. Would you like a bite? I don't mind sharing. Really? You don't mind sharing my own famously disgusting croissant with me? What can I say? I grin. I'm a generous soul. He shakes his head and then as a thought it just occurred to him. I know a really good French bistro. My entire body perks up. Oh, they have a bakery too. My body perks up and tingles. Yeah? They make excellent croissants. I go there often. The sun is still shining. The birds are still chirping. I've now spotted five butterflies and the noise in the background slowly recedes. I look at Eric, study the way the shade from the trees falls across his face, I study him as closely as he's studying me. In my life, I've been asked out for drinks by enough random acquaintances than I think, maybe. Just maybe. I might know what he's trying to get at. And in my life, and in my life, I wanted to say no to drinks with every single of those random acquaintances, which is why I have learned to prevent the question from even being asked. I am good at broadcasting disinterest and on a viability very, very good. And yet, here I am, on a New York bench, clutching a croissant, holding my breath and hoping. Ask me, I think at him, because I want to try that French bistro that you know, with you, and talk more about money laundering and a whole system's approach to environmental engineering and purple underwear that is actually lavender. Ask me, Eric Nowak, ask me. Ask me, ask me, ask me. There are cars in the distance and people laughing and emails peeling off in my inbox. 18 floors above us, but my eyes hold Eric's for a long, stretched out moment and when he smiles at me, I notice that his eyes are just as blue as the sky. Chapter 5 Present According to the plaque above the floor selection console, which, by the way, does not include an emergency button, I am mentally composing a strongly worded email that will likely never get sent. The elevator has a 1,400 pound capacity. The inside, I'd estimate, is about 15 square feet, 14 of which are inconveniently taken up by Eric. As usual, thank you, Eric. A stainless steel handrail is installed in the innermost side, and the walls are actually quite pretty. White baked enamel or some similar material that maybe dates the car a bit. But hey, it's better than mirrors. I hate mirrors in elevators and I'd hate them the most in this elevator. They'd make avoiding glimpses of Eric about three times harder than it already is. On the ceiling, between the two energy efficient, I hope, resist lights that are currently off, I noticed one large metal pane. And that's what I've been staring at for the past minute or so. I am... I am no elevator expert, but I'm almost positive that's the emergency exit. From my 5 feet vantage point, Eric is somewhere between 6'3 and 6'6. Based on that, I approximate that the car is about 7 feet tall, too high for me to reach on my own, and too offset from the wall for me to use the handrail as a climbing point, but, but, I am sure that Eric could easily lift me up, I mean, he's done it before, on several occasions, in the span of the 24 hours we spent together. 
Like when we got hungry halfway through the night, he picked me up like I was a four pound kitten, deposited me on his kitchen counter while I gasped in awe at his beautiful overfull fridge, and then proceeded to inspect an extensive series of Chinese leftovers before sharing them with me. Not to mention that not to mention that other time when we were in his shower and he put one hand under my ass to push me against the wall and the point is he could help me reach the panel I could dislodge it climb out of the car and if we're close enough to the upper floor I might be able to pry the doors open and hoist myself out at that point I would be free, free to go home and feed Ozzy, who's no doubt currently whistling his little heart out like he always does when he hasn't eaten in more than two hours. He'd look at me like I'm a horrible rodent mother, but then he'd be begrudgingly accept my carved stick and snuggle in my lap. And, of course, when my phone has reception, I'd call for help so that someone can come take care of Eric. But I wouldn't stick around to see him out, because I've already had plenty of... No. I startle and look at Eric. He's still in the corner opposite mine, giving me a flat stare. No, what? It's not going to happen. You don't even know what... You're not going to climb out of the emergency exit. I nearly recoil, because despite my magical thinking tendencies, I am aware that mind reading is not really a thing that exists. Then again, I am also aware that this is not the first time Eric seems to know exactly what's going on in my head. He was pretty good at it during our dinner together. And then later, of course, in bed. But in this house, EA, my brain, we don't acknowledge that. Well, I say, you're way bigger and way heavier, so you can't do it. Plus, I'm not sure I trust him not to leave me here. I've trusted him before and heavily regret it. Neither can you, because I'm not going to let you. I frown. I might be able to reach the exit by myself, in which case you technically don't have to let me. If that happens, I'm going to physically prevent you from doing it. I hate him so much. Listen, what if we're stuck in here for days? What if me climbing out is our only chance? There is nothing to suggest that the elevator won't start up again the second the power outage is resolved. We've been in here for about 30 minutes, which is nothing considering that the repair crew is probably working on the grind to fix a block white outage. Not to mention how incredibly dangerous what you are proposing would be. He's right, I'm being impatient and irrational, which flusters me. I... only for me. His face turns into a stone. Only for you? You'd be safe in here, you just need to wait for me to call help and... You think I would be okay with you putting yourself in danger? At Vaseline, Eric is not exactly a warm, convivial guy, but I had no idea he could sound like this. Deceptively calm, but furiously, icily leave it. He leans forward as if I to better glare at me, and his hand reaches up to close around the the handrail, knuckles stretched wide. I have a brief vision of him snapping it in two, 
His anger, of course, gives me anger FOMO and makes me just angry. So I lean forward too. I don't see why not. Really, Sadie? You don't? You don't fucking see why I wouldn't be okay letting you out of all people? He looks away abruptly. Jaw tense, a muscle ticking in his cheek. His hair, I notice, is shorter than when I touched it. And I think he might have lost a bit of weight. And I cannot. I truly cannot bear how handsome he is. Would you really rather do something that idiotic and reckless than being here with me for a few more minutes? He asked, turning back to me, voice icy and calm again. Of course not, I'm almost blurred out. I'm not some horror movie not quite final girl who follows the death this way signed only to be flabbergasted when an axe murder chops off her leg. I'm usually a responsible, level-headed person, usually being the keyword, because right now I'm kind of tempted to run into the loving, axe-wielding bosom of a serial killer. Rationally, I know that Eric is right. We won't be stuck in here for long, and someone is bound to come get us. But then I remember how betrayed and disappointed I felt in the days after he did what he did. I remember crying on the phone with Mara, crying on the phone with Hannah, crying on the phone with Mara and Hannah. Being here with him seems just as reckless as anything else, honestly, which is how I find myself shrugging and saying, kind of, yeah. I expect Eric to get angry again, to tell me that I'm being foolish, to make one of those dry jokes of his that made me laugh every time. Instead, he takes me by surprise. He looks away guiltily. Then he presses his index and forefinger in his eyes. Like he's suddenly overwhelmingly exhausted and murmurs quietly. Fuck, Sadie, I'm sorry. Chapter 6 Three weeks ago I have a grand total of zero superstitious rituals centered around dating. And I promise I'm not saying this to brag. There is a simple reason I haven't convinced myself that I need to chuck down a Capri Sun or do seven jumping jacks before going out with someone, which is, I do not date, ever. I used to, of course, once upon a time, with Oscar, the love of my life. Like Hannah often points out, it's a little misleading for me to refer to a guy who met another woman at a data science corporate bonding retreat and two weeks later called me in tears to tell me that he was falling for her as the love of my life. And I swear, I do get the irony, but Oscar and I go way back. He gave me my first kiss with tongue when we were sophomores in high school. He was my date to the senior prom, the first non-family person I went on vacation with, the one whose shoulder I bowled on when he got accepted to his dream school in the Midwest, exactly, seven states away from me. We actually made it work pretty well during four years of long distance for college. And we did get to spend summers together, except when I was on internships, which was, well, yes, every summer but junior year. And I had that coding boot camp at UCSB then, so, yep, every summer, 
so maybe there were no summers together, but I did end up with a killer CV. And that was nice, better even. When we graduated college, Oscar was offered a job in Portland, and I was going to follow him and find something there. But I got into Caltech's PhD program, which was too good an opportunity to pass up. I really thought we could do four, five more years of long distance, because Oscar was a great guy and so, so patient and understanding till the beginning of my third year, till the day he FaceTimed me crying because he'd met someone else and had no choice but to break up with me. I wept. I stalked his new girlfriend on Instagram. I ate my weight in Tolentic gelato, salted caramel truffle, black raspberry vanilla perfect, and on a particularly shameful night, mango sherbet melted into a pot of Midori Sour. I am filled with regrets. I cut my hair short to what my, heart, my hairdresser dubbed the longest bob in the history of bobs. I couldn't bear to be alone, so I slept in Mara's bed for a week because Hannah tosses around way too much, and I'm pretty sure she changed the sheets twice in the five years we lived together. For about ten days I was utterly, soul-smashingly heartbroken. And then... Then I was more or less fine. Seriously, considering that Oscar and I had been together for almost a decade, my reaction to being one sidely broken up with was nothing short of miracles. I aced all my classes and my lab work, I spent the summer touring Europe by train with Mara and Hannah, and a couple of months later I found myself shocked to realize that I hadn't checked Oscar's girlfriend Twitter in weeks. Huh. Could it be that it wasn't real love? I found myself asking my friends over Midori Source. Since Mango Sherbert, I had regained my dignity by then. I think that there are lots of kinds of love, Hannah said. She was nestled next to me at our favorite booth at Joe's, the grad student bar closest to our apartment. Maybe yours with Oscar was closer to the sibling variety than to anything resembling a passionate affair between soulmates. And you're still in touch. You know what you still love each other as friends. So your brain knows that there's no need to mourn him. But initially I was really, really devastated. Well, I don't want to armchair psychologize you. You totally want to armchair psychologize me. Hannah smiled. Please. Okay. If you insist, I wonder if maybe you were more devastated at the idea of losing your safe harbor. The person who was there for you since you were kids and promised to be there for you forever than at the idea of losing Oscar himself. Could it be that he was a crutch of sorts? I don't know, I poked at my garden's cherry. I liked being his girlfriend, he was so… there, you know? And when we were apart I missed him, but not too much, it was… easy, I guess. Could it be that it was too easy? Mara asked before stealing my lime. I've been pondering her question ever since. But there hasn't been anyone after Oscar, which means that he still technically retains the title of love of my life. Even if two months ago I got an invite to his wedding, pretty glaring clue that I'm not the love of his. 
I could have gotten out more, I guess, especially in grand school. I could have tried harder. When one door shuts, another opens, Hannah and Mara would say. Now you can date around. You missed out on so many hot dudes in the past few years. Remember the guy we met on in Tucson? Or the one who always asks you at conferences? Oh my god. The guy in fluid dynamics who was clearly in love with you? You should hit him up. Of course, whenever the topic of my life comes up, because dragging in a sacrosanct part of the covenant of friendship, I never hesitate to point out that even though both Hannah and Mara have been mostly single ever since starting grand school, they barely take advantage of their amazing dating opportunities. It usually ends with Mara defensively muttering that she's busy and Hannah rebuting that she's on a break from hooking up with people because her last two fuck buddies were can I jizz in your hair and human skull on the nightstand girl and they would put anyone of sex it usually ends with us collectively deciding that no relationship could ever compete with our jobs guinea pigs or netflix maybe if the idea was Starving at blueprints is more appealing to me than hitting the club, whatever that even means. What even is a club, really? Then maybe I just hung out with the blueprints. Not that things cannot change, since Mara is now embarrassingly, fantastically in love with her formerly asshole roommate. Maybe the blueprints and I will come allowed tie the knot. Who's to say? Anywho, all of this to say, I haven't really dated a whole lot, which is the sole reason I haven't developed weird ritualist habits around the process, or I hadn't till right now, because I am about 15 minutes into the night and I'm thinking that I'll have to keep these black jeans for the rest of my life. The lightweight green sweater I put on can throw it away. Ever. This is now my lucky date outfit because the second we sit down at the bistro where everything smells delicious and our narrow window table has the cutest little succulent in its center. Eric's phone pings. Sorry, I'll mute it. He does but not before rolling his eyes, which is a fair cry from his usual stoic, nonplussed vibe. I cannot help but burst into laughter. Please, do not mock my pain. He deadpans, taking the seat across from mine. I'm not sure how, but I know that he's joking. Maybe I'm developing telepathic powers. Work? I ask. I wish. He shakes his head, resigned. Way more important stuff. Oh, maybe he wasn't joking. Is everything okay? No, he slides his phone in his pocket and leans back in his seat. My brother texts that my football team just traded one of our best players. We're never going to win a game again. I smile into my water. I never really got into American football. It seems kind of boring. A bunch of overgrown dudes standing around in 80s shoulder pads and bashing their heads towards chronic traumatic encephalopathy. But I'm way too soccer mad to judge fans of other sports. Maybe Eric used to play. He's big enough, I guess then they should really invest in lucky underwear. He gives me a lingering look. Purple. Lavender. Right, yes. He glances away. And I think that this is nice. I'm sitting across from someone who's not Oscar and I'm not feeling too nervous or too much weirder than usual. 
for all that he's a blonde steely mountain of muscles eric is surprisingly easy to be around what's your team giants jets he shakes his head it's not that kind of football i cock my head is it like a minor league no it's european football he Soccer, you'd call it, but we don't need to talk about it. I nearly do a speed take. You follow soccer? An intervention worthy amount according to my family and friends. But don't worry, I do have other topics of conversation like pastries or the practical implementation of smart factory technology or... That's about it. No, no, I... I don't even know where to start. I love soccer. Like, love, love. I stay up till ridiculous hours to watch games in Europe. My parents always get me fancy Hersays for my birthday because that's literally my only interest. I went to college on a soccer scholarship. He frowns. So did I. No way. We stare at each other for a, for a long moment, a million and one words running through the eye contact. Impossible? Amazing? Really? Really? For real? You used to play? I still play. Tuesday nights and weekends. Mostly. There are lots of amateur clubs here. I know. On Wednesdays, I go to this gym near my place and soccer was my first career choice. The engineering PhD was definitely my plan B. I really, really wanted to go pro, but I wasn't quite good enough. He nods. I'd have loved to go pro too. What stopped you? He chuckles. It sounds like a hug. I wasn't nearly good enough. I laugh. So, what's your team and who did they trade? FC Copenhagen, and they got rid of... Don't say Halvorsen. He closes his eyes. Halvorsen. I wins. Yeah. You're never gonna win another game. Not for all the purple underwear in the world. But you weren't gonna win much with him. Anyway, you need a better coach, honestly. No offense. Plenty of offense. He's glaring. You follow women's soccer too? I ask. He nods. Proud OL range supporter since 2012. Me too, I beam. So you don't always have terrible taste. What's your man's team? A cute charming vertical line has appeared between his brows. I rest my chin on my hand. I rest my chin on my hands. Guess I'll give you three tries. Honestly, I can accept any club except for Real Madrid. I continue with my chin hands unperturbed. It's Real Madrid, isn't it? Yep, outrageous. You're just jelly because we can afford to buy decent players. Right. He sighs and hands me one of the menus I never even noticed the waiter dropped off. I'm going to need food for this conversation. And so will you. We have spent the rest of the night arguing and it's fantastic. The best. I suspect the food is as good as he promised, but I don't pay very much attention because Eric has incredibly incorrect opinions on the way Orlando Pride is using Alex Morgan and on the Premier League trajectory of Liverpool. And I must dedicate all my efforts to talking him out of them. I fail. He stands by his wrong ideas and systematically makes his way through the bread. Then an appetizer, then an entree. 
like a man who is used to comfortably consuming seven large meals a day. At the end, when our plates are clean and I'm too full to bicker with him over the upside sanctions rules, we both lean back in our chairs and are silent for a moment. I'm smiling, he is not smiling, but close, and it makes me smile even more. I think this might have been the most fun I've had in years. Okay, false, I know it is. How did it go, by the way? He asks quietly. What? Your pitch? Oh, good, I think. Thanks to face croissant, I grin, undoubtedly, and my lavender underwear. He lowers his eyes and clears his throat. Who's the client? A cooperative. They are building a rec center based in New Jersey and are shopping around for consultants. It's a second location for them. So they bought an old grocery store to turn into a gym of sorts. They are looking for someone who will help them design it. You? And my boss, yes. Though two of her kids have been colicky, so for now mostly me. What did you tell them? I talked them through my plans for energy independence, green building standards a smart water management, minimizing of glass chemicals, that stuff. They were going for a green edge, they say. And what are your plans? I hesitate. I really don't want to bore Eric and I've gotten feedback from literally everyone that when I start talking about engineering stuff, I go on for way too long. But Eric seems more than a little interested. And even though I blubber about raw materials and federal limits and life cycle assessments for over 10 minutes, his attention never seems to waver. He just nods pensively, like he's filing away the information and asks a lot a lots of clever questions. So you got the project. I shrug. They're meeting with someone else tomorrow, so I don't know yet. But they said we're their first choice so far, so I'm optimistic. Eric doesn't reply. Instead, he just studies me, serious, intent, like I'm a particularly intriguing blueprint. Does it make me uncomfortable? I don't know. It should. I'm out with a guy for the first time in a million years and he's starring. Yikes, right? But I kind of don't mind. Mostly, I'm wondering whether he likes what he sees, which is a bit different. I feel sometimes, like I've lost the habit to wonder whether I'm pretty in favor of agonizing over other qualities. Do I look professional? Smart? Organized? Someone who should be taken seriously? Whatever the hell that means. I generally find the idea of men commenting on my attractiveness favorably, or otherwise repulsive, but tonight Right now, the possibility that Eric might find me beautiful uncurls warmly at the base of my stomach, and then freezes when I consider that he might be staring for the, op for the opposite reason. Could he be staring for the opposite reason? Okay, this is... no, I need to stop with the ruminating. What are you thinking? I ask. He hops and laughs, just wondering something. What? He drums his fingers on the table. Whether you want a job? Oh, I still have one. Despite my efforts this morning, I didn't actually get fired. 
I know, and this is very inappropriate, I am aware, but I'd love to poach you, and I, suddenly, I'm feeling hot and weirdly tingly, I like my job, it pays okay, and my boss is great, I'll pay you more, name a figure, I, what? And if there's anything you don't enjoy about your current job, I'd be happy to come to an agreement about your duties. I'm very open to negotiating. Wait, you? Pro VLD, he amends. I frown. He talks about Pro VLD like he has a lot of say in their administrative choices, and I wonder if he has managerial position. It would explain the suit, and the fact that he clearly came to dinner directly from work, even though we met at 8. He's wearing the same clothes as this morning, albeit without his tie and jacket, and with the sleeves of his button down rolled up to his forearms, which look a strong and oddly male, and I've been trying hard not to ogle. I'm about to ask what exactly his job description is, but I get distracted when the waiter brings the check and hands it to Eric, who readily accepts it. Is he paying? I guess he's paying. Should I politely insist that we split? Should I rudely insist that we split? Should I offer to pay for both of us? He did buy the croissant this morning. How does one dine out with company? I have no clue. Thank you, the waiter says before leaving. Always nice to see you, Eric. You do come here a lot, I tell him. He shrugs, slipping his credit card inside the book. Okay, the paying ship has sailed. Crap with big clients mostly, so it's not your default date place. The question comes out before I can turn the words in my head, which means that I don't realize it, its implication until well after it's lingering between us. Eric is staring, again, and I'm suddenly flustered. I don't know if, if you don't I didn't mean to say that this is a date. His eyebrow lifts. I mean, maybe you just wanted to as friends and the eyebrow lifts higher. I clear my throat. I Is this a date? I ask. My voice is small, suddenly insecure. I don't know, he says carefully after mulling it over for a second. Maybe it isn't. I... I didn't want to make it weird. Maybe you just think I'm a nice girl and wanted someone to have dinner with and I totally misread the situation and I'm so, so sorry. It's just I think I like you a lot, more than I can remember liking anyone. It's possible that I projected and the waiter comes to pick up the check, which interrupts my spiraling and gives, which interrupts my spiraling and gives me a chance to take a deep breath. It's all good. So maybe it wasn't a date. It's fine. It was fun. Anyway, good food. Good soccer talk. I met a friend. Can I ask you a question? I look up from the handwriting currently going on in my lap. Is it whether I'm a needy, dangerous stalker? Uh, sure. I don't know if this is a date, he says, serious. But if it isn't, will you go on a date with me? I smile so wide. My cheeks nearly hurt. 